Hello, dear friends, film lovers, and critics. My name is Julia Timoshenko, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Ukraine in English. And today we're going to look at Ukraine and the Russian cinema. We all know that collective societal values, beliefs, and views of the world are heavily influenced by the pop culture. As with any form of art, films can be used to defy, critique, or reinforce cultural norms and political ideologies. Analyzing films within their political, historic, and geographic context can really tell a lot about the society where they emerged. Not only do they tell a lot about their creators, such as directors, screenwriters, and so on, but they also give us a look into the audience for whom they were created. Today we're going to investigate the role of film in the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. Specifically, in this video, we will focus on how Ukrainians have been portrayed in Russian cinema throughout history. In this analysis, put together by Vitaly Gordienko... Um, hi, that's me. I'm famous Ukrainian blogger, by the way. We will demonstrate to you that apart from promoting Russian colonial narratives, Russian cinema has always been discriminating, mocking and belittling Ukraine, its culture, language and people. Not only the Russian cinema has fostered hatred among the Russian population towards Ukrainians, but it also fostered an inferiority complex among Ukrainian population who consumed a lot of Russian content before 2014. By often portraying Ukrainians as cowardly and uneducated, it's been persuading Ukrainians that there is nothing cool about their nationality, and in order to appear better, they need to be more Russian. In this video, we will first look into some examples of the films that came out before 2014, the first Russian invasion of Ukraine. Back then, the relationship between these two countries have been describing as fun and friendly, but then the narrative strikingly shifts after 2014 invasion of Crimea and Donbass. The Ukrainians are not anymore portrayed as fun or friendly. They're turned into evilly traitors. During the Soviet times, Ukrainians in films were portrayed as funny, cheerful, but slightly backwards, or as Russians like to call them, hohols. Hohol is a derogatory and discriminative term used by Russians to describe a Ukrainian person. In Soviet cinema, Ukrainians were usually represented by cheerful, funny and quite simple, mostly secondary characters. A few were even shown as army officers. Как же вы не заметили? Мы же сегодня над моей Украиной дрались. Others were representatives of lower class society or peasants. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this image shifted and Ukrainians became not cheerful and funny hohols anymore, but in fact, evil collaborators and traitors. Let's look into some examples in chronological order. Brother, the 1997 and 2000 film. We'll start with a very famous sequel in the Russian modern cinema. To be honest, these two films were also very popular here in Ukraine. Я до войны мне нравился фильм Брат. Я его смотрел очень много раз. These two films were directed by Alexei Balabanov and became an epitome of the idea of the mysterious Russian soul, a common trope that we can see in Russian literature and cinema today. At the core of the story, we have a humble good guy, a little man who is capable of doing everything for his own values and beliefs. Although the first film is not connected to Ukraine at all, it shows how rooted discriminatory, xenophobic and racist views are in Russian society. The dialogues are saturated with disrespect for everything and everyone that is not Russian. Here are a few examples. Теперь только русские люди торговать будут. А немцы? Зачем немцы? Подкрашенный весь, подпудренный, как баба. Весь такой... Одно слово, румын. Так он болгарин. Да? Какая разница? Welcome to the United States. Добро пожаловать в США. Thank you very much. Вот уроды. Музык твоя американская. Говно. Скоро все в вашей Америке, кирдык. Че тут не упристал, Францис вообще? Пошли. Какая разница? Да ты на себя посмотри. Черный как сволочь. We could assume that it's a deliberate irony chosen by the director in order to highlight problems in his native society. But do the viewers really understand that? In the second part, the director will show that the hatred is not only exclusive and inherent in Russian society. The whole world is in fact built upon that hatred, according to this film. Just think about what it says about the whole worldview of a common Russian person. The second film is more interesting when it comes to the Russian wars. In the very beginning, we see the interview of the main character on the television. He's a participant in the Russian war against Chechnya. The Russian military potential is glorified and being a soldier is shown as cool we can immediately draw a parallel to the war in Ukraine. 
Это была спецоперация. Мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. As we can see, Russian tactic of denying the truth has not changed since the 90s. Later in the story, we were introduced to Ukrainians. Вообще сам-то я из Киева. And immediately after that, we realized that we're not going to be portrayed in a very good context. Let us just watch how the film decides to portray Ukrainians. Тут киевская братва и наехала. Они связались со своими чикагскими хахами там в Чикаго и наехали. Мика все подписал, хах стали тут же. Ломанулся хахлам обратно. Да поздно. Американец оказался круче всех крутых And of course, the Ukrainians are the bad guys and mostly referred to by an ethnic slur хохол. Вы сообщили, что его на борту не было. Да, и отправь хахлам фото лысого. We hear how Ukrainians in this film refer to the Russians as Moscow's. Ну это новый москаль. Вот еще один русский. Татарином клычу. Татарином зовут. Ну и рожа, котики в Москве нема. Кого только у них нет. This was an ethnic name of the Russians before they adopted the name of Kievan Rus stole it and renamed the Grand Duchy of Moscow into Russia. Russians actually find this term offensive because it really separates them from the history of Kievan Rus and really undermines their entire historic Russian ideology. The term Banderovets is actually filled with a lot of hatred and fear in the Russian society. It originated back from the name of Stepan Bandera, a leader of Ukrainian independence movement in the 40s. And now it's being used pretty much against every Ukrainian who believes in the territorial integrity of their country. What's happening here? What is this? Russian mafia! Русская мафия. Там искали украинскую мафию. Русский украинскую мафию пострелял. Пришел вечером до ресторана. Пришел вечером в ресторан Львов и всех убил. Later in the film they also promoted propaganda about Crimea. Remember, this was back in 2000. Вы мне гады еще за Севастополь ответите. Here you can see how Russians are being told they have lost Crimea and they need to take it back because it's historically theirs. А теперь твоя родина две войны и Крым просрала. Русских людей в Прибалтике сдала, сербов на Балканах сдала. Another very common and popular idea is demonstrated here through a phrase Russians do not leave Russians in the war. Русские на войне своих не бросают. This form of patriotism could actually be inspiring if it was real. The Russo-Ukrainian war has proven that Russian leaders and military commanders actually do not care about preserving the lives of their personnel. They didn't care to save them from the Moskva ship, and they also threw them on the front lines without proper gear as cannon meat. And for the finale of the film, let's look at the legendary scene about strength. I will not comment on it, simply just view it through the lengths of Russian-Ukrainian war currently. Just listen to this monologue. Вот скажи мне, американец, в чем сила? Разве в деньгах? Вот и брат говорит, что в деньгах. У тебя много денег, и чего? Я вот думаю, что сила в правде. У кого правда, тот и сильней. Вот ты обманул кого-то, денег нажил, и чего ты, сильней стал? Нет, не стал. Потому что правды за тобой нет. А тот, кого обманул, за ним правда. Значит, он сильней. Let's move to another film, The Nine's Company. It is the embodiment of how the Russian propaganda machine for years demonstrated the strength and power of the Russian military. It was telling how prestigious it is to be a cadet, soldiers, or go fight in Afghanistan or kill Taliban. In this way, they raised a whole generation obsessing with war. Oddly enough, these films did not prepare Russian soldiers for the brutal reality of that war. So what do they say about Ukraine and the Ninth Company? Well, first of all, there was a Ukrainian character who only appeared for a while to talk about Ukraine and to fight the Georgian. But there is also another Ukrainian character. Will you guess his name? Of course, it's Hohol. Let's move on to the next film called If the Military Campaign is Tomorrow. This film is actually about children's relations. The story takes place in Ukrainian Crimea in 2004. And here is a scene about two boys meeting for the first time. First of all, we hear a terrible Ukrainian spoken by the kid actor, and the next scene is actually mind-boggling. Our territory, you see? Ukraine! What? It was our country. 
a hint that even children know and should know that Crimea is a part of Russia. The targeted audience for these series are predominantly children, however, it has very strong political messages. The Ukrainian characters here are the enemies, so the boys begin to fight. And of course, the Russian beats the Ukrainian, even though he is smaller. In one of the next scenes, we see how Ukrainian Crimean Tatars are playing Nazi soldiers as if it is something normal. The obsession with World War II is actually very common in Russia. They take a lot of pride in the fact that they beat Nazis in the 40s and they fail to recognize that they're actually the Nazis of today, of the 21st century. Here's another Russian claim for Crimea. <laughs> Is it now becoming more clear to you why most Russians are so okay with the illegal annexation and occupation of Crimea? The next film is called 72 Meters. This is a Russian war drama released in 2004 about Navy crew that first served in Sevastopol during the times of the Soviet Union. After the 1991, the crew was transferred to the northern fleet of the Russian Federation. Unlike the other films, this one doesn't really deal much with Ukraine. To be more precise, not so often. Ukraine was mentioned only in one episode. In one scene, several characters stay on a flooded ship and discuss their past. Suddenly, the character played by Marat Basharo asks this question for literally no reason. And this dialogue prepares us for the following scene, which is meant to show the extreme loyalty of the fleet of the Russian Federation. It shows how soldiers did not take an oath to Ukraine in 1991. This obviously questions the entire idea of the loyalty of Ukrainians to Ukraine because they choose to stay with Russia. У тебя же здесь дом, сад, огород. Ты что, все это богатство хочешь поменять на голые сопки? Да там же девять месяцев полярная ночь, зима полгода. Дети рахитами будут. Я твоей жене сейчас позвоню. Желающий принять украинскую присягу, выйти из строя. Остальные, айда за мной. Оркестр! Прощание, славянки! Taras Bulba, the 2009 film. This is a painful wound in the history of Ukrainian cinema. An authentic Ukrainian story about the Cossacks was filmed by Russians, who in the 18th century actually exterminated those Cossacks. Moreover, all of these Cossacks speak Russian language, which is just historically wrong, as most of them spoke Ukrainian. In the main role, we have perhaps the symbol of the Ukrainian cinema, Bohdan Stupka. He praises the Russian soul from the first minutes of the film. <laughs> We don't really understand why Stupka decided to act in this film. There is a story behind this that somehow he was presented with a different script at the beginning, and when he signed the contract, later those Russian ideas were added to the film. Most likely he would have to pay a fine for breaching the contract, that's why he wasn't able to quit. Taras Bulba is an ideal work for a Russian film adaptation. In his times, Mikola Gogol, the author of the original novel, pursuing pro-Russian political goals and fulfilling the request of the government, contrasts the Cossacks with the Poles, and not the Russians, with whom Cossacks actually fought at least as often as with the Poles. Showing how the Cossacks were fighting against the Poles and not the Moscow oppression helped to reinforce the ideology of Russian imperialism. The Cossacks were basically painted into Russian soldiers, which is again, from a historical standpoint of view, is completely ridiculous. Пусть 
Any Eastern European historian would actually find this bizarre because the last thing the Cossacks did was praising the great Russia. Also in the film, Ukraine is often pronounced as Okraina, which translates to borderland and makes you think that it's not really a real country by itself. The actors also twisted Ukrainian language, making it sound kind of Russian. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a scene where Cossacks get drunk and miss the attack, which is also kind of ridiculous because Cossacks usually didn't drink during military action. Overall, Taras Bulba is a gross, twisted misrepresentation of Ukrainian and Cossack culture. As they do it very often, Russians just decided to appropriate that piece of history and make it sound and look Russian. The 2010 film Kandahar. This film tells about a team of pilots who were captured in Afghanistan because they were transporting ammunition. One of the pilots is Ukrainian, played by another popular Ukrainian actor, Bohdan Benyuk. The film was directed by Andriy Kavun, who is from Lviv, but he shot most of his big projects in Russia. After 2014, he returned to Ukraine to work in his home country, which is why it's pretty surprising that his film Kandahar perfectly matches all the narratives of Russian propaganda. The viewers understand that this very character is Ukrainian actually by judging how he talks. In the middle of the Russian sentence, he would insert Ukrainian words, just randomly. Here we see the usual archetype, a stout man with a mustache, a typical peasant. During the whole movie, he will only be a tacit, cowardly, inferior Ukrainian. Here in the beginning, he's scared and asks to land, while the Russians proudly don't want to give up. Further, he continues to show his small Russian attitude. And further, he appears as a dumb coward. Later in the film, he's only causing more trouble. And again, we see the continuation of the narratives that the Ukrainians are cowards, unable of any military gains or progress, unlike the Russians. To sum it up, Benyuk's character is dumb, ridiculous, and cowardly, but he's still loved by the audience because Russians and Ukrainians are shown as the same people. Apart from demonstrating the evilness of the Ukrainian people, they also like to steal our heroes in order to show that there are actually no Ukrainians as such, they're only little Russians, as Russians call us themselves. One example of such a tactic is a film about Ukrainian wrestler Ivan Podubny, who was born to a Ukrainian family of Cossacks during the Russian Empire. Here, the history was also twisted to make Ukrainian Poltava look like a typical Russian province, where everyone behaved like a Russian. <laughs> where children are running around in a Russian traditional clothing called Kosovorodkas, and their fathers beat them if they do not fight with other boys and cry like girls. Ivan Podubny is also shown to act like a stupid, proud Russian. <laughs> He's capable of nothing except showing off his physical strengths. You may see it in many scenes, and it manifests itself in a bunch of other episodes. <laughs> It is my money? Это мои деньги. Yes, sir, this да, is сэр, они ваши. I want my money. In addition, here Russians are also trying to appropriate Cossack history because Ivan Podubny is a descendant of Ukrainian Cossacks from Zaporizhia. And of course, the film would not be complete without devaluing the vest and emphasizing the beauty of the isolated Russian world. Paris, Paris. But still, one of the most interesting facts about this film is that the directors are intentionally trying to cut out 
Dubny from Ukraine by showing him as a completely Russian man and not showing Ukraine in the film at all. The director actually decides to invent a whole new nickname for Ivan Pidubny, a Russian bear. That nickname cannot be traced in any historic documents, but they really put it in our faces throughout the film. But it turns out that the Russians were actually not convinced that Pidubny was their hero. In 1988, they smeared his grave and wrote Hole and bastard, meaning that they still know that he was actually Ukrainian. This was only a selection of the prominent Russian films that came out before 2014. As you can imagine, there is so much more there, but we cannot fit it in one video. The ideas about Ukrainians are pretty much the same in most of them. In case you don't remember, in 2014, Russia illegally occupied Crimea and invaded the eastern part of Ukraine, causing a massive IDP crisis, destruction of the infrastructure and economic downfall. The Ukrainian government has responded to the Russian aggression by banning major social media networks from Russia and screening the Russian films in the theaters. However, many Ukrainians still continue to consume Russian content on YouTube, music streaming platforms, and so on. Starting from 2014, Russian cinema has shifted its narrative completely in regards to Ukraine and Ukrainians. If until then Ukrainians were portrayed in their films as antagonists, after 2014 they started completely disappearing from the film screens. How is it possible? Well, the Russians started filming the films about Ukraine, but without the Ukrainians. Let me show you the example of the battle for Sevastopol. It's a biographical war film about Lyudmila Pavlichenko, a young Soviet woman who joined the Red Army to fight the German invasion of the USSR and became one of the deadliest snipers in the World War II. She actually took down more than 300 enemy soldiers. Despite that the film was a Ukrainian-Russian production, the film does not mention anywhere that the protagonist is actually Ukrainian. Lyudmila was born and raised near Kiev, and also that's where she learned how to shoot. Well, you can say that it's implied because Kiev is mentioned in the movie quite a few times. However, you never hear that the Ukrainians are fighting in the Red Army. In fact, it's only Russia that is fighting against fascism, according to the film. The next film is called Gogol The Beginning. It is a 2017 Russian fantasy horror film directed by Yegor Barabov and very, very loosely based on the works of a Ukrainian writer, Mykola Gogol. Geographically, the film set is in Ukraine, which back then was a part of Russia. Empire, but obviously the word Ukraine is never mentioned in the film. Here's how they show Ukrainians. And of course, Russians depict Ukrainians in the most stereotypic way. Remember how in previous films, Ukrainians were always drinking, eating piglar and borscht? Well, it's the same here. Yank Petrovich, chleb sol, chleb sol. Again, Russian creators don't shy away from mocking the Ukrainian language. Characters who are chosen to represent locals are heard speaking very broken, almost comical version of Ukrainian. Тогда ведь еще несколько девчин пропало. О, такой же знак находили везде, где девчин убивали. There's also a scene featuring a Ukrainian wedding. However, again, elements of Ukrainian culture are shown in the Russian environment. We never learned from the film that this is Ukrainians and Ukraine that are being portrayed on the screen. In fact, for someone who is not from this region, it might appear that Ukrainians in the past were, in fact, Russian, because we never see them as self-defined, at least not in this film. The next film is called Union of Salvation. It is a 2019 Russian war epic period adventure film directed by Andrei Kravchuk. This film is about the group of anti-Tsar conspirators who became known as Decemberist Revolt. In the film, Russian generals and soldiers refer to Kiev a lot. However, for some reason, it's located in a fictional country called by Russians Malorossia or Little Russia. К службе в частях первой и второй армии в Малороссии без права отпуска. Перечисленные заговорщики служат в Малороссии. At the same time, their location caption says Ukraine, Kyiv province. This might be an intentional move to actually show that Ukraine has always been a part of historic Great Russia. And again, there is a stereotype about Pig Lar being used conveniently in the story. Just look what they ask the general who is being sent to Ukraine. Вас изжога от свиного сала не мучает? 
не имел счастья проверить ваше свидетельство. Ну вот он выпал. Поедете в Киев. The entire film provides a clear Russian perspective on Ukraine that didn't change much from the Tsar Russia. Ukrainians are portrayed as little Russians and Ukraine is often referred to as Malorossia or Little Russia. That makes the audience believe that it doesn't have any particular culture except of drinking and eating pig lard. Moving on to the next film, Chernobyl Abyss, that was released in 2021. This is a Russian film directed by Danilo Kozlovsky in a response to a famous HBO series, Chernobyl. Russians didn't really like how they were portrayed in the film and the leaders and authorities, so they decided to create their own disaster drama. This film represents or rather misrepresents a story that fully develops in Ukraine in 1986, just four years before Ukraine voted to become an independent country from Soviet Union. But this film makes people believe that Ukraine as a country emerged outside of some sort of vacuum because in this film we see the country, the Republic, portrayed as a part of the USSR. However, we never see Ukrainians or Ukrainian culture mentioned in the film. This is a particular convenient narrative for a country whose leader justifying the invasion of Ukraine with some quasi-historic narratives. The next film in this sequence are supposed to represent post-Maidan Ukraine, the Russian character. This film shows a Russian coming to Crimea and being shocked at how nationalistic and Ukrainianized it is. Хорошей погоды. О, ты вы Сюда подходим. The inhabitants are shown speaking primarily Ukrainian, but this is not an act of mercy from the Russian directors whose colleagues were mocking the Ukrainian language for years. Ukrainian language in Crimea is shown to scare the Russians about what could have happened with the peninsula had Russia not saved it. Что встали? Дали дороги нема. Иди сам, я не поеду. А что ты так заговорил, братан? Ты ж по-русски понимаешь? Я сказал, дальше не поеду, иди сам. Так, деньги давай, только свои рубли не суй. А нормальные гроши давай, 150 гривен. The Russian protagonist constantly meets pathetic and mean Ukrainians on his journey. Мне нужен кто-нибудь из руководства, из уголовного розыска. А шо? Нашу ему вы не знаешь? Сам то кто? А шо? С русским языком здесь какая-то проблема? Ну, что нужно? А? Another film called Crimea was released in 2014 as a story of love, faith, honor against the backdrop of the real events of the Crimean Spring of 2014, or that's how the film is being described on IMBD. In reality, it was a masterful piece of propaganda and lies. The film opens with a sequence of a protagonist laughing at the girl for coming to write about Ukrainian history to Crimea, implying that it's something absolutely impossible because there is no Ukrainian history in Crimea, according to Russia. What are you doing? I'm filming a movie about the Ukraine. In Crimea? Here too, and what? On the seventh minute of the film, they start showing the scenes from Maidan Revolution, which was an uprising by Ukrainian people against their pro-Russian government at that time. But for Russians, of course, it's some sort of staged coup by the Americans. The protagonist stands on the side of the policemen, who are being unfairly attacked by the protesters. He gets closer to one of them, and he explains how the entire protest has been orchestrated. У нас уже трое, все по схеме, и по нам, и по ним, чтобы толпа окончательно отверяла. The movie actually shows how regular Crimeans are being beaten up by some crazy far-right extremists in Ukraine. This is based on zero factual evidence, but who cares, right? The film fully backs up Russian conspiracy theory that tells that Ukrainian Maidan revolution was organized and planned to repress everyone in Ukraine and force them to be Ukrainian. Then the plot focus shifts from the personal story of the protagonist to the annexation, or how the Russians would like to say, liberation of Crimea. We see another very popular Russian narrative in this film, victim blaming. Russians blame other countries and people for defending themselves. They say that if they were to lay down their arms, they wouldn't be dying. Петр, ребята с Майдана и ваши беркутовцы, а сейчас война, здесь, в Крыму, и никому этого не остановить. In the end, the film shows the Ukrainian saboteurs who actually wanted to stand up and fight Russians when those were taking over Crimea. Это ж война. Но кто-то должен начать. 
иначе вы тут все сдадите без единого выстрела. But Russians quickly found them and prevented from the bloodshed. The film ends with a tribute to the Russians and Ukrainian military officers who did not shoot each other in March of 2014. It is written in a way to make you think that Russia is actually against spilling blood. Unfortunately, we know it's not true. This was the last film in our list. As we told you at the beginning, this video is an ambitious effort to show you how Ukrainians have been portrayed in the Russian cinema throughout history. The role of the visual media in the formation of societal values cannot be overstated. We've seen how the Russian cinema uses colonial narratives to belittle Ukrainians, mock their culture, and demonstrate the Russian superiority over Ukraine. It plays directly hand-in-hand -hand with the Kremlin propaganda and its efforts to erase Ukraine and its culture as such. This kind of portrayal of Ukrainians in cinema makes you understand why so many Russians actually support the current invasion of Ukraine. For years, they've been told that they are superior over Ukrainians, that their culture is greater, and Ukraine actually doesn't have any historic grounds to exist. These kinds of narratives have been constantly repeated on Russian TVs, whether it's in the speeches of their president or in their cinema and it manifests in one kind of emotion, hatred towards Ukrainians that can justify their death and suffering.